and conservation. Uh, our presentation coming up next is increasing carbon storage in the working forests of Canada and the United States. Uh, just a reminder again, if you run into any issues during the session or have any questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right of the webinar screen. You can also use the chat box to send messages, but those messages will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit questions to the speakers, and we hope you do, uh, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in your toolbar at the bottom of the webinar screen. We'll be sorting through those questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. Um, and if you're just joining us, uh, again, a reminder that the presentation will be recorded and shared with all participants. So on to the substance. Uh, here at WCA, we're interested in how different forest management practices provide different ecological and social benefits, including carbon sequestration and storage, which is critical in mitigating the climate crisis, as we all know. Uh, forest management certification is one tool available for landowners to demonstrate third-party verified responsible stewardship of forest land. Uh, as forest managers, consumers, and society at large have become more focused on carbon and natural climate solutions, stakeholders are seeking to understand the connection between forest management and certification and carbon sequestration and storage. So today, we'll learn about new analysis um, that will be published by the Forest Stewardship Council this week, which allows us to begin to understand the connection between FSC certification and carbon. The Forest Stewardship Council, or FSC, has been providing assurance of responsible forest management since the mid-1990s, with a mission to promote environmentally sound, socially beneficial, and economically prosperous management of the world's forests. Much has changed globally since FSC's creation, including the recognition that ecological forest management uh, and FSC certification can be a powerful nature-based solution for fighting climate change. As a side note, Washington Conservation Action is a member of FSC US Environmental Chamber, and I'm proud to serve on the board of FSC US alongside NGO and industry partners. Uh, in this presentation, we'll hear about results from preliminary analysis of FSC practices, including case studies from major forested regions of Northern California, Western Canada, and the Gulf Coast. So we can understand how much impact FSC practices are having on carbon storage on a regional level in Canada and in the US. So I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker, Amy Clark Eagle. Uh, Amy Clark Eagle joined the Forest Stewardship Council US in 2016 as the Director of Science and Certification. In this role, she leads FS, the FSC team dedicated to development and application of FSC policies and standards in the United States, including the FSC US National Forest Stewardship Standard and the FSC Controlled Wood US National Risk Assessment. Amy spent much of the previous 20 years collaborating with government and non-government partners to develop and implement landscape scale conservation and management plans, uh, primarily in managed forest matrices. Prior to joining FSC, Amy served as Biodiversity and Conservation Program Leader for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Forest Resources Division, where her responsibilities included internal and external collaboration on species and ecosystem uh, conservation initiatives, and working to ensure maintenance of the FSC forest management certification on 4 million acres of state administered forest lands. Amy's a graduate of Amherst College and earned her MS in Wildlife Science at the University of Washington Seattle um, College of Forest Resources. Um, so Amy, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. All right, now I am going to share my screen. And I have just flipped between apps we were using Teams a minute ago, so uh, apologies for the hesitation there. And can you guys see the presentation screen or the um, note screen? Presentation screen, you're good. Excellent, yay. Okay, so um, as Rachel said, I'm presenting today on the results of some research that we at FSC US did in partnership with FSC Canada. Um, as Rachel noted, it, the report itself is not yet publicly available. It, maybe tomorrow, um, but uh, I can't sh cannot share a link at the moment. However, it will be available from the FSUS website. 
Uh, for transparency's sake, um, I want to share that I was not actively engaged in either the design or implementation of this project. Unfortunately, the staff who were are no longer with FSEUS, so I'll do my best to, to represent here uh, today. Okay, so to shift, there we go. Quick outline, I uh, want to help do a little bit of level setting, do a bit of background on the Forest Stewardship Council, um, and what we represent, uh, then get into the research results and um, also provide a little bit of information about the FSC Ecosystem Services Procedure. Uh, this procedure provides a framework for FSC certified forests to demonstrate enhanced ecosystem services, uh, including carbon storage. Okay, so first a uh, little bit about who we are and our relationship to climate smart forestry. So in 1992, uh, the governments of the world came together for the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they wanted to develop a blueprint for international action on the environment. And there were some really positive um, uh, some positive motion on some topics like biodiversity conservation and some other things. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of work on the, the really important topic that identified at the time, still important, uh, regarding deforestation and particularly in the tropics at that point. Um, as a result, a group of businesses, environmentalists, and community leaders came together. Uh, they wanted to try and create change in forest management uh, and create better outcomes from the forest management practices. They founded FSC. Uh, it was officially incorporated in 1994 as a market-based solution, and I'm going to come back to that concept in just a minute. Um, but as Rachel noted, our mission is to promote re environmentally sound, socially beneficial, and economically prosperous management of the world's forests. The primary way we do that is through uh, forest certification. Okay, so when I said that we're a market-based system, um, when, when you look at this and you look at the bottom, that's the market, the buyers and the customers. And we wanted to see the market driving demand for certified products. So those are the things that are produced in the middle of this slide, which in turn would divide, uh, drive demand for certified forests up at the top, which in turn drives positive changes in forest management and uh, in the outcomes from those changes. Um, as you look at this, we have policies and standards that address the different parts of our system, forest management, chain of custody, trademark. The ones in the middle, the chain of custody and trademark, we have policy and standards that are consistent globally. Uh, so the, it's applied in the same way, um, regardless of which country you're in. For the forest management certification, we have a framework of principles and criteria that are consistent globally. So those are applied um, everywhere in the world, but as a standard for uh, forest management certification or forest, um, I'm sorry, for stewardship certification, um, as that standard is developed, indicators are um, identified that are uh, regionally or nationally adapted, but that still ensure that the principles and criteria are being achieved within the forests that are certified in that nation or region. Uh, the forest management standard, and particularly that framework of principles and criteria, are how we define responsible forest management. Um, we are increasingly find it important to focus on climate change and carbon. Um, this is due in part to our members. Our members are asking us um, to make this a focus of our work. We are a member organization. Uh, we have members that are divided into three chambers. You can see them here um, on the slide. And each one of these chambers has equal weight when it comes to making decisions. Uh, the members are responsible um, for helping to set the strategic direction for uh, the Forest Stewardship Council globally. Um, and like I said, they're all aligned in agreeing that responsible forest management really needs to address climate change. 
Um, we're also looking as a market-based uh, system, we're also looking at what is it that the, that's driving the markets? Um, you know, what's influencing their decisions and therefore having an impact um, on the uh, forests themselves. So when we look at this though, we realize there's kind of two things that need to be considered um, as the market. So the, the buyers, the customers, the corporations at the end of the, the supply chain, as they're making decisions, we're seeing that they're looking both within their supply chain. They're, they're thinking about, you know, if I have a goal for net zero or for decreasing, you know, my our carbon impact, they're off there looking within the supply chain, how can they reduce um, emissions? How can they increase carbon sequestration and storage in the forest where they are, um, where, the, where their materials originate? So what kind of impact can they have there? They're also looking outside of the supply chain in, in terms of offsets and can they have an impact in some other place that will help to offset their own um, activities as it relates to carbon. Okay, this is lots of words. I'm just gonna, not gonna go through all of it um, in detail, but as I mentioned previously, all of the four stewardship standards around the globe for FSC are built on the same set of principles and criteria. And I'm actually gonna put a teeny tiny asterisk there. Um, our principles and criteria were revised within the last decade. Most uh, standards around the globe have actually, the process has been completed to update the national or regional standard to incorporate the new principles and criteria. Um, here in the US, we're at the very, very end of that process. We've not yet completed it. Uh, and so the research was actually done using the, uh, the old set of principles and criteria because that's where our US standard is right now. But at the scale of principles and criteria, there's, they're very, very, very similar. Um, some, uh, many of the indicators are gonna be changing, but that big framework um, that you see here in terms of the 10 principles is the same or is very similar to what was um, the framework for the research that was done. The whole point of this is looking at the kinds of strategies and approaches that are identified as being important for storing additional forest carbon um, and looking at the types of management practices. Uh, as you can see from the lines, you know, we believe that many of these, um, well, most of these are being addressed um, by the FSC principles and criteria and the and our uh, standards. The one that is not um, is our current neither our current standard nor the revised standard that's coming soon. Um, require the prioritization of um, management of locations that provide high carbon value. Um, so generally this puts forest cert or FSC certified forests in a good position to access potential financial benefits uh, if they're able to verify the in, um, carbon stored or what they're doing to maintain or enhance that carbon storage. Um, also, importantly, you note that this is uh, the arrows only point to two of the 10 principles um, because the, the forests are also providing protection for a wide range of values, um, even if the forest managers may be more focused on carbon as an outcome, carbon storage as an outcome. Um, uh, also briefly wanted to um, bring you to the Working definition of climate smart forestry uh, that's been put together by the Climate Smart Wood Group. I believe um, that the this group is part of a presentation next Wednesday um, as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these individually, but this definition of climate smart forestry is actually really well aligned uh, with the FSC principles and criteria and the expectations for FSC certified forest um, around the world. Okay, so there's um, some existing, uh, um, but can be limited data um, that links the responsible forest management as defined by FSC with uh, climate smart forestry. One in particular, I, whoops, hello, 
something just happened on my end. I don't think you guys want that to see my notes. So I'm gonna swap that back. Okay. Um, I wanted to call it in particular uh, research that was completed by Ecotrust um, in your neck of the woods, uh, which I suggested that there were carbon benefits associated with FSC certified forest in the region where that work was done. Uh, but we really wanted to look um, further and look beyond to see if these kinds of benefits were available uh, in other parts of the country as well. Okay, so that takes us to the research. Uh, the question we asked is, what is the potential carbon impact of FSC certified management in specific ecoregions relative to common practices? And I'll come back to how we define common practices here in just a minute. Uh, the project began, the research project began in uh, January 2021. Um, we and our partner, uh, FSC Canada, hired SCS Global Services to measure the amount of carbon stored by U.S. and Canadian forests, managed using both FSC practices as required by that national standard, um, compared with common practices. The case studies, there were three case studies completed. Uh, they were completed in Western, uh, one in Western Canada, up in the Boreal, uh, the one in Northern California, uh, in a Redwood region, and then also um, mixed pine uh, forest down in the Gulf Coast of Southeast US. Okay, so uh, the consultants used a peer review model uh, called FORTAB to quantify two simplified policy scenarios. Uh, the first, the common practice, uh, looked at forests managed under the requirements that were set by the provincial or state government uh, as well as in the United States uh, case studies considering the state level best management practices for water quality. Um, and this means that because of the variation in the baseline um, between in baseline practices between different states and different provinces, the results of these studies um, will vary uh, or would vary if repeated in other places across political boundaries. Um, on the FSC, side of things, the second scenario uh, were consider the practices that were re are required by FSC certification in that particular location. Uh, Canada has um, consistent indicators across the entire country now. They uh, revi completed revision of their standard here in the last couple of years. In the United States, um, most of the indicators are applicable uh, regardless of where you are in the United States, but there are some elements that change from one region to another. Okay, so this is um, the, the real high level uh, summary across the three case studies in the boreal, the pine, and the redwoods. Um, I wanna point out that the work was done to model only above ground carbon storage, uh, the below ground potential resource there was not considered in this particular research project. So you've got first the results in terms of additional carbon storage on the FSC for the, um, the FSC practices, and then what the key practices were that were identified. Uh, so starting in the boreal, as you can see, this was the place where the, um, the smallest amount of additional um, carbon storage was identified. Even though there was additional on all of them, it, it varied quite widely. This is where the smallest amount was um, identified. And there was um, noted in the, in the project though, that there was an increasing divergence between the two harvest policies, FSC versus the provincial baseline um, throughout the 40 year planning horizon. And this suggested that additional carbon storage in the FSC certified forest might be achieved over a longer uh, time horizon. Uh, the difference between the common practice and the FSC practices 
was um, focused in, it looked like the biggest difference had was due to the um, requirement in the FSC Canada standard for 10% of the management unit to be designated as within a conservation areas network. And the lands in these network areas uh, tended to emphasize older, older lands. Okay. Moving to the, the middle case study there, the mixed pine in, along the Gulf Coast, um, due to data limitations, uh, the consultants were not able to model uh, the, a combination of factors. So you can see that there's um, two there ident that were looked at separately. The first one, um, considering opening sizes and green up requirements around those openings. Um, and then the second one separately looking at riparian buffer widths. Uh, as you can see, about 22% more carbon stored on average under the FSC scenario than under the common practices scenario. The third one, is the Northern California case study. Um, and this is where we saw the greatest uh, difference between the common practice and the FSC practices. The elements that were identified um, as being responsible for this were the modeling used an uneven age management scheme. Um, want to emphasize that this is not required by the FSC standard. However, definitely the indicators encourage this type of management scheme. Uh, many of the FSC certificate holders in Northern California do manage with an uneven age management scheme. However, there are some um, that use an even age uh, management scheme. But for this particular project, the modeling was done using the uneven age uh, management approach. The uh, other elements that uh, had an impact on the difference in carbon stored between the common practice and FSC practices were the maintenance of high conservation value forests and also differences in riparian buffer widths. So um, the kind of big key takeaways from the research project overall is that even though this um, represented a very conservative look at uh, and modeling, uh, considering the differences in these practices, um, because the, the, the modeling was only completed using subsets of data. Again, only above ground carbon storage was considered not below ground. Um, but still overall, we saw ad um, additional carbon stored on FSC lands, and it potentially even undersells the impact of FSC management um, in this way. However, uh, as a result of the research of this project, we probably learned more lessons about how to do this kind of research than the actual results. And those are the second and third takeaway. Um, we found that asking or, or using inventory for inventory data from private forest lands was actually very difficult. Uh, we, we had to go through um, some data confidentiality efforts. The uh, participants really wanted to make sure that when the research results came out, it was not possible to identify exactly who uh, was the participant in each of the case studies. Um, they were very concerned about the information about the lands that they manage becoming publicly available. Uh, we also, as I said in one of my uh, previous comments, there were some data issues. We had um, spatial data layers that didn't line up uh, and so found that, you know, it, it really limited what you were able to do in terms of modeling and comparing between different places when you had really different variable quality uh, in terms of the data themselves. Um, the last one is also, you know, tracing materials from the market, so from the end of the supply chain back to a force of origin in the US can be really, really difficult. And we're kind of thinking about, you know, when you're, when you're doing data based on inventory of a specific forest, being able to make that connection and say something about a product and the impact of that product, um, it just, it adds to the complexity. Um, so therefore, we're, we definitely think there's additional research that needs to be done and really recommend um, developing other approaches uh, that don't require 
uh, data inventory or inventory data from individual specific private forest lands uh, for accounting and comparisons and really encourage looking for options that are using remotely sensed and publicly available data. So because um, um, my understanding that most of you are likely based and working in the Pacific Northwest, I uh, thought I would dig into the results for that Northern California case study uh, a little bit more. Okay, so these are um, more specifics about the scenarios that were used for the case study in Northern California. It was a comparison of the California practice rules um, with the FSCUS forest management standard and those elements that are specific to the Pacific Coast region. So you can see in the first bullet on each side, um, typically in California, you'd see even age management, whereas the scenario that was modeled for this project considered um, uneven age, an uneven age management scheme. As I noted, this is not required by FSC, but definitely encouraged. There was a difference um, between the two scenarios in terms of the required buffer widths. Uh, uh, the California practice rules do have green up constraints. Uh, these were not applicable to the FSC scenario um, because there weren't any uh, openings in terms of um, clear cut openings. Uh, for the common practices scenario under the California forest practice rules, uh, the limited harvest to size class three and four trees or um, to stands if they were smaller than that to stands that were at least 65 years of age. For the uh, FSC scenario, they modeled using two entries, each with each of those entries removing about 25% of the volume of the, the forest stand. Um, California forest practice rules scenario, they did not include any additional constraints related to forests that were unable to be harvested. On the FSC side of things, they did include a 5% constraint for high conservation value forests. Uh, this 5% is not a requirement uh, within the current FSC standard uh, for the US. Uh, it's just typically what we see for um, certificate holders in the region. And this was a 5% beyond the riparian buffers. Okay, so specifically for those riparian buffer widths, um, you can see that for class one and class three streams, uh, the FSC standard requires a wider buffer than the California State Forest Practice Rules. Okay, and then here is, uh, as part of the modeling, the volume harvested uh, over the 20 year uh, her, uh, planning horizon for the for the project. Um, you can see that there's a pretty consistent under common practices, the baseline, and that for the FSC scenario, uh, there was a slight increase over the 20 years uh, for the amount of volume being harvested. And then finally, the that above ground carbon, um, the modeling suggested that there would be an increase over time under the FSC scenario, whereas under the, the baseline or common practices scenario, the um, above ground carbon would slowly decrease across the 20 year horizon. Okay, so what this, um, what we, we believe this says is that uh, responsible forest management as defined by the FSC uh, principles and criteria offers an opportunity to sequester additional carbon while also maintaining and enhancing the code benefits that are generated by certified forests, including ecosystem services, such as water and biodiversity conservation. Uh, although these results are only one step in truly quantifying the impacts of FSC certified management, they add to the value of purchasing FSC certified products, and they call attention to the need for more high quality public data that considers forest management practices in quantifying climate benefits. So kind of looping back to what uh, Rachel said at the introduction to this presentation. 
Uh, this research suggests potential benefits associated with FSE certified management that warrant further uh, exploration. And this is something that we're definitely hoping to be able to do in the coming years. Okay, so um, wanted to spend just a little bit time on um, some, some things that FSC is doing to help certi our certificate holders take advantage of the carbon benefits um, that are being produced within their certified forests. So um, FSC, uh, I honestly can't remember how many years ago, um, published the FSC Ecosystem Services Procedure. Um, it, as says here, it provides a framework for verifying and communicating positive impacts of the forest management that's occurring within FSC certified forests. So you, in order to use this procedure, you have to first have um, a certified FSC certified forest. Um, the procedure sets out the requirements uh, for forest managers to demonstrate the impact of their activities on the maintenance or enhancement of ecosystem services. Um, our, we believe that this will improve access to finance for validated ecosystem service enhancement impacts. Uh, and it will also allow promotional claims by the sponsors of verified projects. And that's the financial sponsors um, for verified projects. The procedure provides a globally consistent seven-step approach for demonstrating ecosystem services impacts. These steps can be followed by uh, communities, uh, forest owners, forest managers, um, whoever um, you know is involved and responsible for the certified forest, uh, to provide evidence of the positive impacts that the management in that forest is having. Uh, the for they can choose from a list of potential impacts. I'll share this with you in a minute uh, that they would like to be able to demonstrate and verify. The evidence for the positive forest system, or excuse me, ecosystem service impacts uh, is assessed by a third party auditor using the same system of assurance that's used for getting that forest certified, FSC certified in the first place. So um, the five of these um, are part of the existing ecosystem services procedure. Um, so biodiversity conservation, uh, carbon sequestration, water services, soil conservation, and recreational services. Those can all be um, ver documented and verified using the existing ecosystem services procedure. Uh, last year at the global at our general assembly, our members uh, made a decision that they would also like to see cultural value conservation included as an ecosystem service that can be verified using this um, procedure. Associated with the ecosystem services procedure, there's also guidance that provides accept acceptable methodologies for how to quantify each of these ecosystem services, um, but it doesn't limit to just those that are listed. You can use other methodologies if they're assessed to be equivalent to the ones that are listed. Uh, currently, there's more than 70 ecosystem service claims that have been made globally. Most of them are in Europe and particularly in Southern Europe, although there's a growing number in Latin America. Uh, generally, each time I go and check to see how many uh, there have been completed, it just is, it's a continually growing number here. Um, the procedure is currently under revision. Uh, the idea is to take what's been learned through these 70 plus that have already been completed uh, in hopes to, excuse me. <coughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, with the hope of streamlining the procedure, reducing the cost of implementation, increasing clarity on what may and may not be claimed as a result of the procedure and the verification that's uh, involved with it, uh, and also increased rigor for methodology selection. We do not yet have any verified claims in the United States or Canada, but we're working on it. Um, However, I think that based on the, the research 
that I've been talking about, we can expect that certificate holders will be able to demonstrate uh, additional carbon storage. So uh, in conclusion, um, the research results find that even though FSC is not optimized for carbon, uh, it's designed to address many other values. Uh, carbon benefits are realized across all the different ecosystems um, that were assessed, uh, although this will definitely vary um, basing on, based on where you are. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This was accomplished or these carbon benefits are accomplished while also ensuring that other important social and environmental values are also being considered <coughs> and conserved. So sorry. <laughs> and we're also working to support our certificate holders in <coughs> in getting these benefits uh, recognized. So, sorry, happily, this is the last slide. <coughs> oh, excuse me. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna mute for a second. Um, thanks so much, Amy, for the great presentation. Happy to give you a moment to recover from the great presentation. Um, and, and just say thanks again for sharing the results of, of FSC's new analysis, hot off the presses, presented publicly for the first time. Uh, and it's really exciting to see resources dedicated to better understanding the connection between forest management and carbon. Uh, we'd love to see a lot more analysis in this space. So we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I'll kick us off with the first one. I hope folks keep questions coming in in the, the Q&A, although we've got plenty over here to keep us going. Um, this study focuses on three specific regions and a couple specific practices for each of those regions. Um, how should we interpret those results more broadly? And what other analysis could be done or is planned to broaden the understanding of carbon impacts uh, and FSC certification? Yeah, I think it's really, really important to recognize that there were different results in different places. And that was due in part both to <clears throat> what does common practice represent? I mean, there's a there's a very high bar um, when it comes to common. Well, you know that doesn't really make sense, but um, there, the bar in different states um, goes up and down uh, depending on what's the requirement of those um, particular jurisdictional practices. So I think that the important thing is that it, there is going to be a difference and it's going to change depending on where you are and what you're doing and what those common practices are compared to um, the FSE practices, it also, you know, there, there's an impact on what the goals and objectives of a particular forest manager may be, um, whether they're more economically focused or um, more ecologically focused or somewhere in the middle. Um, I think that the, the important thing to recognize is that regardless of the different, very, very different ecosystems and very different um, kind of jurisdictional spaces, that there was um, a, a difference found, um, that there was an additional amount of course carbon stored in all of the different examples. So I think that it suggests that we are likely going to find additional start carbon stored when we look at other regions and ecosystems as we would like to. Um, we also hope to expand and um, look at some of the other ecosystem services and the impacts of FSC uh, practices when it comes to the other ecosystem services as well. So hopefully that answered your question. It did, yeah. Yeah, it strikes me. Um, I'm very familiar with all of the indicators and criteria in the standard and thinking about how this analysis looked at just a few of them, but there are many others that would have an impact on not only carbon, but many other ecosystem services. Uh, maybe that's a segue to ask you a little bit about the um, ecosystem services procedure. So, um, you know, you mentioned there's, I think you said 70 ecosystem services claims across the world, none in the US yet. Um, when or how can landowners and potentially interested buyers of ecosystem services in the U.S. get involved in the ecosystem services procedure? 
Yeah, um, there's a bit of a chicken and egg here in terms of getting uh, the ball rolling in the United States. We recognize that there is a cost associated with uh, using the ecosystem services procedure because there's a, a, some additional auditing that has to occur. Um, and so typically before making that decision, um, a landowner is going to want to know, well, what's going to be the benefit, you know, the financial benefit. And that's the that's the piece that because um, we haven't had a lot of this happening yet, um, that's getting that idea of how much uh, might be a sponsor might be willing to provide to uh, a landowner as a result of this um, is is kind of it's going back and forth between those two. So um, we do now have um, uh, information about some potential sponsors who maybe who are interested in investing um, within their, you know, looking at forests within their supply chain here in the United States. So I'm hoping that we can kind of get back past the chicken and egg and make it an easier decision for one of our certified forests, one or more of our certified forests. Um, to become involved in this, and then once we have some some pilots and some you know some examples, I think in the United States, that then there would be um, it would be easier. We'll have some lessons learned and be able to help additional um, existing certified forests uh, to work through the ecosystem services procedure, and then also um, encourage others who may not yet to be certified and be able to show that there's a value in doing so. That makes sense. Thanks for the explanation. And just to pivot to an, an example of a FSC certified landowner on our first day of the conference last week, I know you weren't able to join us, but we heard a presentation from FSC certified landowners, Richard and Deborah Pine, whose land um, I know you've visited. Um, and they've been exploring participation in the carbon market, but, but have been unable to do so because they were already managing to a high standard and they ran into additionality challenges. Um, could the ecosystem services procedure be an option for a landowner like them if the carbon market doesn't feel like the right fit? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, the ecosystem services procedure uh, provides options for either verifying that you are maintaining um, something, and it could be maintaining compared to the landscape, um, or it provides an option for showing that you're enhancing through your management practices, you're enhancing um, the carbon being stored. And with that information, um, again, you might be able to work with a sponsor that's within your supply chain instead of going to an external um, carbon market if that's not working for you. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that there are opportunities um, to be found with uh, using the ecosystem services procedure uh, particularly given what we've seen happen in other parts of the world. That's helpful. Um, thank you. And I guess one more question about the ecosystem services procedure for now, and then we'll pivot to talk a little bit more about carbon uh, and the study. Um, I It caught my attention the new um, cultural value conservation aspect you mentioned of the ecosystem services procedure. It sounds like that's probably quite new still, uh, but can you share a little bit more about that? So um, the the members uh, at the General Assembly last year felt that it was very important to recognize that forests that have cultural values within them, whether they are for local communities um, or for uh, indigenous, indigenous peoples, uh, that forest management practices that are required by FSC to maintain those values should also be recognized as an ecosystem service. And so the, that's the idea behind including that within the ecosystem services procedure. That's really exciting. I look forward to seeing how that evolves as it gets underway. Um, okay, to pivot back to carbon a little bit. Um, so you mentioned specifically below ground carbon was not considered in this analysis. So we know that soil carbon, uh, soil is a significant carbon sink and an important component of the carbon cycle, though it's less well understood or quantified often than above ground carbon. Are you able to share any additional knowledge or reflections with us about um, soil carbon and how you would expect soil carbon to vary with some of the practices analyzed in the study? Yeah, I think that um, the, the practices that were analyzed in the study, I mean, they were all very much focused on maintenance of existing forest and forest canopy um, and trees and that kind of thing. 
Um, I think that looking at FSC, um, the indicators in our current standard, and then also what will be in the revised standard, there's an emphasis on um, reducing site disturbing activities. There's uh, requirements to consider the both short-term and long-term impacts of site disturbing uh, activities. And as an ecosystem service, carbon storage and sequestration should be considered as part of that evaluation. So I think that the, the standard itself um, kind of encourages and emphasizes a, a reduction in the amount of site disturbing activities um, compared to uh, common practice. Uh, I do think that as with the other um, elements of the standard that were considered in the in the modeling and in this research. Uh, it will be different depending on where you where you are, whether there's a focus on natural regeneration versus planting um, and you know other elements and aspects of the of the forest management. Thanks. It'd be wonderful to see some research on that in the future. Um, on soil carbon. All right. So we got a couple of questions from Seth, Seth Zuckerman at NNRG. Um, he asks, can you put the increased carbon storage in context? For example, what percentage does a 0.28 ton per acre increase in the mixed boreal forest represent or the one ton per acre in mixed pine? Can you help us understand the magnitude of that in some way? Unfortunately, I cannot. Um, my apologies, Seth. Uh, I would. I think that's a great question. And it's one that I am going to follow up on and see what we can do to um, do exactly that and put it in context and and we'll work on that one so sorry no answer but really good question <laughs> fair enough um we'll, we'll pivot to another question from seth so he gets one answered um so the benefit that was modeled for the increased carbon storage in the redwood region is that borne out by any sort of on the ground measurement e.g by correlation with fia plots uh, so the the contractors, so SES Global Services, um, my understanding is that they did look into and try and um, use FIA uh, as part of this, but just the the as a as a source of information and data, the resolution um, just simply wasn't good enough to be able to um, you know directly apply it to both the FSC certified forest and then the, the non-certified ones that were being considered. Um, so the, the answer is, as far as I'm aware, no. Uh, there has not been uh, the application of or use of anything else to try and verify the, the results. Got but again, it. good question and something to look at moving forward. Thanks. And I should have checked my acronyms there. Um, FAA is Forest Inventory and Analysis Program mm -hmm. data collected yep. by the U.S. Forest Service across the state, which I know you know, Amy, but just in case anyone in the audience was curious. Yeah, it's um, it's done on a sampling protocol. And then there there's they do modeling to smooth um, between where the samples occur. But you the 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 cost and the expense to do as many samples as would really be necessary to get the, the resolution of information that we would need for that would be very difficult. It's a great national data source, but has limitations if you're looking in particular yep. areas. Yeah. Um, next, we have a question from Paul Vanderverb. It's the same Northwest. Was the California carbon area chosen because it is connected to specific products available to the market from that area? If so, what wood products would building projects design with to align with that wood? Um, it was selected because it's an area um, uh, that's representative of um, markets uh, that are important in the U.S. in terms of wood products overall. Uh, it was not uh, selected due to um, a specific uh, market or product, um, but just that this is an area where there's a lot of um, wood products uh, generated um, that are used and not even just specifically for FSC purposes. Um, so no specific wood products, uh, just generally that's it's an area that's important for wood production overall. Thank you. We are about at time. So I'll ask our last audience question, um, which you could relate to FSC, but maybe you also have general knowledge to share with us. This is from Timothy Leadingham. Uh, have you studied the impact of fire on uneven aged multi-story forests in different regions of North America? How could you use prescribed burning in a multi-story forest? 
I am sorry, we have not uh, conducted that. I'm not, uh, gosh, I was at a conference last week um, where I think that would have been a topic of high interest to the participants. Um, I am not specifically aware of any research on that particular topic. Uh, I'd encourage folks who maybe are aware to drop some thoughts into the chat box. I love that idea. And actually, that, that's a great uh, topic perhaps for us to consider for a future carbon conference. Um, OK, I guess we will end it there right on time. Um, thanks so much again, Amy, for uh, sharing this new research with us. Um, it was really great to, to learn more about it. And I hope folks dive into the report when it is released uh, very soon, like Amy said, maybe tomorrow. Um, <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank you to all the attendees for taking part in this session. We'll take a break for about 10 minutes to set up for our next presentation. So stretch your legs, get some fresh air, check your emails, and we'll see you back here for the next session at 3.05. Thanks so much. Thank you.